It's really, I'm really excited to be back in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. I had a, a really fun three and a half years here. And uh, it, it's always a pleasure to come back. I'm, I'm always thrilled when you come to the tunnel out into the city. Isn't that great? Yeah. So, um, so here we are together, and the engineers will get the slides figured out anyway, but the slides are just to entertain those of you who don't speak English. <laughs> and um, so, as I was preparing for this talk, I wondered, well, okay, so what is it that I could tell you that would be unique? And what, what, why would you want to come listen to me talk? You know, because there's um, so much science, but I don't know, I find that it's easier for me to read science than to listen to somebody present it. So I thought, well, what do I know? You know, and, and so I have, I have this history, you might say, of, of experience in interacting with, with people around spirituality. Look, the words have appeared. This is this is so that if you go to sleep, you can you can come back to, to where we are. So let's see if I can understand this. Um, so I, and I want to begin. Slides also help me to remember uh, to give thanks to the Haudenosaunee Nation. This is their tribal land, and uh, are there any Haudenosaunee? So, um, yes? What? No? Oh, no. But at least, but, but their spirits are here. This is their ancestral land, the land that houses them. And we're, of course, close also to the Lenape territory. And the Lenape, of course, claim that they wrote the Haudenosaunee uh, Constitution. To, they claim that they brought the Six Nations together into the Confederacy. Everyone has a claim about everything. So, and so, and I also, of course, I mean, thank the ancestors of this land that want to thank uh, Sven and, and Dr. Shankar for bringing me here because I'm, it's great to be back. And uh, I live in Maine now. Um, we learned one of the. Oh, the microphone. Okay, so I got to talk to this microphone because the microphone for recording is here. So I have to act like I'm afraid if you guys see. I've got to put a shield here in case you throw tomatoes or something. All right, so we'll use this microphone. Um, so we learned we learned um, some really important main camping songs like Larry the Radioactive Lobster Boy. So. Um, so why is this important? Um, so we could talk about we could talk about religion. We could talk about spirituality. In many ways, they're the same thing. Though uh, some people turn religion into um, law, you know, into rules. Um, but it has to do with um, the ways in which people rediscover meaning in times of crisis. And, um, and so when we, when we think about healing, we're interested, I think, in spiritual transformation and how do people transform? How do they change in such a way that they can take advantage of the power of spirituality? And so I'll, I'll talk about spiritual transformation throughout my time with you. But I want to I want to define it uh, as primarily a fundamental change in the place of the sacred or the character of the sacred as an object of significance in the life of a person, and secondarily to a fundamental change in the pathways that a person takes to the sacred. So, so we can we can be a Christian before spiritual transformation and be one after, but the character, the quality. It is different, and I think probably Thomas Merton is an amazing example of that, of how he transformed over the course of his life. And um, 
So, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. And um, so, I was I was privileged to grow up outside the mainstream, which wasn't necessarily easy. But um, I I didn't I wasn't healing challenged. I didn't grow up in the belief that healing only happened in hospitals with guys wearing white coats. And so I grew up in southeastern Kentucky. Um, some of you have heard of Pennsylvania, which is where Kentucky people come when they move to Pennsylvania. Um, there's also Ohio Tucky, and and that's where I went for high school. We we finally made it into Ohio. You know, the dream of everyone in Kentucky is to move north. So, uh, and you don't meet many people from Kentucky because it's hard to get out. <laughs> Hard to escape, and and I'm I, I you can truly tell uh, that I'm a person from Kentucky because I'm missing a tooth, uh, though I lost mine playing hockey with Canadians, which um, I recommend against because they don't they take the game much too seriously. Never play hockey with Canadians. Um, so um, so I didn't really I took my I took my. Um, upbringing for granted. Didn't think much of it. You know, my my mother, like many in that generation, was trying to be a refrigerator, you know, um, and I don't fault her for that. The, the way out of poverty was to, was to be white, you know. And we were, as are many people, a, a blend of nations. Um, I, I want to uh, urge you to stop using the word race, since it doesn't exist. It's not a biological reality. There are only nations, not races. And um, so we were a blend of Scottish and um, Cherokee on my mother's side, and on my father's side, uh, Lakota and Quebecois. Um, my parents met compliments of the Korean War. They, um, they used to pay women to dance with airmen, and sometimes they did more than dance. So here I am. <laughs> Thank you, Mom and Dad. Um, so, um, so medical school was a shock for me, and and I I felt the need for healing. You know, I I needed counseling. I needed an elder to hang out with. My grandfather was too far away, and um, the people that I could connect with were too far away, and the. The day that, that this happened for me, I was at a lecture. Um, I was at Stanford University. There was a famous fellow uh, who discovered the metabolic syndrome lecturing, and he started the, the day by saying, life is a relentless progression toward death, disease, and decay. The job of the physician is to slow the rate of decline. And, and I thought, that's not what my granny would say, you know. And um, it disturbed me a lot, actually. And I thought about my great-grandmother who said that you should, you should die healthy so that you're ready to party on the other side when you walk across. But they didn't believe that you had to be sick to die. They just thought it, was, it got to be your time and you win. And so I ran over to the Stanford Indian Center, and Henrietta Blue Eyes was at the reception desk, and I presented my predicament to her, and she gave me two names, uh, a fellow named Gidla from Ukiah, and a fellow named Grandfather Roberts from um, up near Garberville. And so I was, I was with those guys by the next weekend, Though I have, to, though Grandfather Roberts was was, uh, he made me wait 24 hours to to see him. I showed up and he wasn't home, so I just camped out in front of his house and you know studied studied anatomy actually. And he showed up 24 hours later and he said, "You're still here," and I said, "Well, yeah. Where else was I gonna go?" And he said, "Well, I guess I gotta talk to you." So that was his screening tool to see if I was really serious to, to meet with him, if I'd wait 24 hours. 
Um, but, um, and incidentally, as they got me through medical school, they also helped me to, to misplace my asthma. You know, I'd carried it around for a lot of years, and, and I seem to have left it in California. So if you run into my asthma, don't bring it back. It's somewhere between Garberville and San Francisco on Highway 101. Um, but so, so I learned to think of spiritual healing before any other form of healing. Now we see, you know, I've seen a lot of people who come to, who call me at, at you know, death's doorstep, and, and they want to go find a traditional healer. And I'm always thinking, well, why didn't you call me five years ago? You know, why are you waiting until, why do you, why do you want to challenge these people to do, you know, such hard work? You know, why don't you make it easier on them and go when you're only a little sick? But, you know, that's the way it goes. So, um, <clears throat> so this, this, uh, I have to short digression into into the ideas that helped me to to walk away from to to part the way, you know, to go a separate direction from from asthma, at least in the severity that I used to have it, because um, I can still get it if I get really stressed, and it's a reminder not to that I'm I'm not Superman, but. Um, what the, what this what was explained to me was that there were many paths in life, and that the way to get to the place that we wanted to go was to imagine being there. And in that way, of the many different futures that existed, the one that we wanted to get to would pull us there. You know, and so what this what the what this elder taught me to do was to imagine a future in which I was breathing okay. I, I was breathing easy. I didn't even think about breathing. It didn't occur to me to worry about it. It was just a, taken for granted. You know, and, and to sit quietly and to imagine that and, and to believe that I could be there and that there were spirits who would nudge me along the path to get there. And, and that's when I learned about parallel realities. <coughs> Later I learned that there was a whole theory of parallel realities, you know, the, the um, many worlds theory of quantum physics, the multiverse. But this was, this was the, the down-home version, you know, of how to negotiate the quantum multiverse. And, you know, when you, when you hang out with elders, you meet people who would surprise physicians with their stories. That's why they don't tell their stories to physicians. Because mostly when they tell their stories, they get negative responses. I met a guy, uh, I was at a ceremony in Fond du Lac, Minnesota, and I met a guy uh, who'd had cancer and that was about eight years ago, and he was at the University of Minnesota Hospital, and they told him to go home and get his affairs in order. There was nothing they could do for him. So he went home, and he didn't have many affairs, so it didn't take him long to get them in order. And so then he thought he'd go see this, this local fellow who was rumored to be, you know, to be able to do a powerful doctoring on people. And he figured this guy could tell him what the other side was like because he, w he was curious if he was going to go there. He, he wondered what it would be like. And so he went to see this guy, who was, was the same guy that was going to lead the ceremony. That was eight years ago. And he said to this guy, he said, well, the doctors say I'm dying. And he said that the, this that's the that's the that's the healer coming through his energy. So little he's he's crossed over, so he's free to visit us whenever. <laughs> so this this elder said, "All right, all right, I'll get it." 
That's what he said. <laughs> but that's in spirit talk. Use this microphone. Use this microphone? Okay. Just stay close. The spirits are in this microphone. <laughs> anyway, he said, them damn doctors, they don't know everything. <laughs> He said, I got a bunch of people here went down there to die and just couldn't do it. <laughs> so so he introduced uh, he introduced this fellow to other people who were supposed to die and didn't. And it, it's it's really fun to hang out with people who were supposed to die and didn't because they're really funny. Uh, everybody I've met who's supposed to die and didn't has a good sense of humor. Apparently the spirits want to keep them around because they're entertaining. <laughs> you know. So, um, so if you don't have a good sense of humor, better get one. <laughs> so, you know, when you go to ceremony, you, you often meet, you meet people like this. You meet people who had terrible conditions that disappeared. And, and so you come to believe that this can happen. You believe in the possibility because you talk to the people. And, um, so, what nowadays we, we it's more acceptable. Now we call it energy medicine. We call it, um, you know, spirituality is more acceptable in 2013 than it was in 1993, let's say, or, or especially than it was in 1973. Um, so these things that the, that the people did, this prayer, ceremony, doctrine, you know. It, we could call it energy medicine and make it respectable. And um, I think of it as the alternative medicine of the 1950s. You know, because where I grew up, nobody, I mean, they, nobody could go to doctors because nobody had any money. <clears throat> and so, you know, people went to each other and, and they helped each other. And before, you know, I just want to, I just want to invite you to think about what's different between these healers and um, conventional doctors. What's different? And it's the same, I'm, I'm talking about Native North Americans because that's what I've spent my life exploring. But we know some voodoo priests and it's the same for them. We know some African people, it's the same for them. We know some Australian Aboriginal healers, it's the same for them. So what's different? Um, it's not a business. They're not, you know, there's there's no greed attached. You know, greed is a very dangerous thing. Um, my wife Barbara was telling me about, me about this series of shows called The West. And and that's what emerges is, is the the devastating power of greed. And these these healers, you know, if you gave them a gift, they'd take it. And and if you didn't give them enough of a gift, they might not see you again. Because um, <clears throat> they expected you to give something commensurate with your, you know, um, resources. But I, I've seen people offer them a cigarette, and that was enough. And that was enough compensation, because that was a lot for that person, you see. And I, I knew a guy, Hawk Littlejohn, in North Carolina, who's walked over now, but when he was still on this side, he went to see a rich lady at um, the hospital there in Chapel Hill. And, and she offered to pay him and he said, I don't, I'm not going to take your money. And she said, why? He said, because it's of no value to you. You got too much of it. He said, what I'm going to take, he said, what I'll do, what I want from you, in order to work with you, he said, I want you to do something truly self, selfless for someone. That's my price. You do something truly selfless, and I'll, and I'll come doctor you. She could never figure out how to do that, so he never went and doctored her. But uh, he, he was, uh, you know, hors de prix is the term in Quebec, outside of price. You know, there's, he couldn't be bought in that respect. And, and the other idea they had is they didn't see the healing coming from them, you see. Um, they didn't take a lot of credit, though one of them joked with me that he'd always take the fee. He said, never take the credit, but always take the fee. And 
because they lived in a mysterious universe of, of min multiple beings interacting in strange and wonderful ways, unpredictable in, in their effects and what, they would, what cases they would take on. I remember one guy, I took someone to see this Cherokee dealer in Tucson, and he said to this woman, you've got to eat a watermelon every day for 30 days. Afterwards I said, why was that? He said, dude, that's what the spirit told me to tell her. I said, I don't know. You know, so, um, so it's, it's um, in, in this North American world, it's an interactive world with spiritual beings. And um, these, these, these people we're talking about, they're not elitists. They, they don't proclaim to be experts. If you ask them if they were a healer, they'd say, no, I'm not a healer, I'm just an ordinary guy. You know? And it, would, it was, the way you would know somebody was, was worth going to. If you were in the community and you had a problem, you would say, hey, I got a, I got a sore knee. And they would say, oh, go see Joe. He's pretty good at that kind of thing. But they wouldn't give him a label. And uh, so outside of ceremony and doctrine, they're just regular people. They're not on a pedestal. They wouldn't want to be. And so they practice what we desperately need, which is non-hierarchical relationships of cooperation and sustainability. There's a, there's a wonderful... Um, and simple computer model that some guys at the University of Maryland built, which shows that all societies with elite class collapse. They've, they've modeled you know, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Mayan Empire, the Aztec Empire, and empires I've never even heard of. And they all collapse if they have an elitist group. And, and I won't go into the reason for that, but... Um, you know, it's time, it's time to uh, remove the hierarchies, to overthrow the experts. Um, I don't know how we do that. Nothing's worked yet. <laughs> but the, the worst, the most dismal failure was the Russian Revolution, so don't try that again. The French Revolution didn't go so well either. You know, every, everyone just replaces one hierarchy with another. So, um, so now let's talk about spiritual transformation. Um, so we defined it before. And um, what are the tasks for producing spiritual transformation? Because this is what most of the, the elders tell me, is the explanation for healing, for really big healing. You know, you can get a really small healing just by drinking tea. One of my uh, favorite elders who's also walked across from Saskatchewan used to make a wonderful tea for cancer. It had sturgeon eyeballs, um, blueberries, sturgeon liver, um, rat root, and a few other delicious items. And I used to kid people, I'd say, if you could drink that tea every day, you really want to get well. <laughs> so, must have a lot of vitamin D though. Sturgeon liver is full of that. Um, so we want to create the predisposition to be healed. So a lot of people come to see me and they say, heal me. I'm like, what? How am I going to do that? You know, and, and we, so apparently we, it seems like we have to be active. We can't just, you know, want it and not do anything. So, and then we have to feel connected to the spirits. You know, spirituality, at least in North America, is not up there. It's all around us. We're embedded in the spirit world. One elder told me, spirit world is, is about this much above this world, and this much to the side. You know, and, and you can, he said, you can catch glimpses of the spirit movement all the time. He said, it'll be in the corner of your eye. He said, if you look at it, it's gone. But if you just look ahead, and you, you watch with that, that sort of not watching, seeing out of the corner of your eye, you'll see the spirits moving around. Um, so, <coughs> we, already, <coughs> we already talked about what was, to some degree, what was important to these people, these elders that I'm, I'm telling you about. 
Um, but it was all about relationship. You know, they, they worked the mind-body connection. They, they developed an audience for the healing. Now, um, you'll be interested to know that um, we, we, know, we now know that experience affects you more profoundly if you're with other people than if you're alone. This, this study has been carried out mostly with animals. Um, there's a zebra finch. Anybody have a zebra finch or know what they look like? Well, it's, it's a songbird. <coughs> and if, if they hear another zebra finch singing the zebra finch theme song, there's a gene that gets induced in their brain. And it, I think it's called EGR1. And so if they're with their mates, if they're with a bunch of other zebra finch listening to the same song, it gets induced dramatically greater. Biologists call this the audience effect. Same thing happens with uh, fish. There's a particular um, sword-tailed fish. And you know these fish have more hierarchies than humans. It's really remarkable. And their coloring determines their place in the hierarchy. And there's genes that control the coloring that get induced, turned on by social experience. This is called epigenetics. And so um, it's, it's the presence of other fish that determines the level at which this gene is induced. So the audience effect is powerful and demonstrable in the brain. So it, the experiences you have with other people in community or in ceremony are going to have a more powerful impact upon your genes than if you were sitting alone at home. So, the, so and it's good that neuroscience is finally catching up with the Lakota. <coughs> so, um, the, the other thing that they talked about, too, is that whatever the spirits tell you to do, you've got to do it, and you, and you can't stop doing it. Keep at it. You know? and, um, and sometimes that means a big change in your life. So I'm going to tell you now about some data, because, you know, it's a CME. Some of you are getting credit, so I've got to give you some data. And then maybe a couple stories. I'm, I'm a little bit, we started late, so I don't know. If somebody give me a 10 minute warning, I'd be really grateful. 10 minute warning. Yeah, see, I asked for it. <laughs> I guess I'm rallying my mouth too much. This is a study that we published in uh, 2012 in a journal called Advances. Um, um, Barbara and I and Michael Valenti are the co authors. Um, we looked at 155 people who went to see traditional healers. These, these were native and non-native people, um, or I should say members of the nation and non-members of the nation. And um, we wanted to see what happened to them. Now, prior to doing this work, we, we published another paper in a journal called uh, The Qualitative Report, which is a wonderful journal and free if you're interested. It comes out of Nova University in Florida. It was a paper showing that we could reliably and accurately quantify levels of spiritual transformation using um, the human equivalent of lab rats, which were undergraduates. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we wanted, we, we wanted to look at outcomes, and so we, took, we looked at, this is the top half of the slide, the, the bottom half will come in just a minute. And so these were the conditions that they brought to the healers. Okay. And we wanted a really simple scale that anybody could measure, you know, because we were going to call doctors and relatives and find out what had happened to people. So cured means no sign of disease for five years. That's the accepted medical definition. Better means it's shrunk or it's improved, you know, you're breathing easier. The same, that's sort of obvious. 
worse or you're dead. So that's our five-point scale. And um, so um, you can, here's the second half of the scale. So we have 155 people. 56 who sought out healers were cured. 55 were better, 23 were no different. Eight were worse, and 14 were dead. So what does that mean? Well, we need it. You know, you can't randomize people to healers. Healers wouldn't take them, they wouldn't go. So the best we could do was to come up with a comparison population, which is easy now because of electronic health records. So we looked at the electronic health record for people with the same major conditions at the same approximate age, you know, same gender, um, and stuff like that. And so we asked the same question. If you follow these people for five years, what happens to them? And so for the comparison group, we followed 100 people for five years. So well, we didn't do it for five years. We looked at five years' worth of data from the practice, you know. And this is what happens. Um, mostly people with a presenting problem of alcohol and drugs get worse. Mostly people with schizophrenia get a little better. Um, you know, if it's a positive number, they're, they're trending toward improvement. If it's a negative number, they're trending toward getting worse. So you'll be pleased to see that, by and large, people who go to conventional physicians get a little better over five years. So it's, uh, the number comes out to be 0.305. However, um, people who go to traditional healers, it was 0.896, which was statistically significantly better. Now, what's unfair about what I just said? Well, the people who go to traditional healers could also go to conventional doctors. Of course, the people who were going to conventional doctors could have also been sneaking off to traditional healers and don't know, you know. Um, so, so people who go to traditional healers, people who seek out traditional healers are no better in five years than people who are just hanging out at a conventional family medicine office. Now, you could say that's because they're motivated. And I would say, okay, sure. That's good. <laughs> Let's give me some more motivated people. I'd like to have them. When I, when I, you know, when I, I don't know why it was so prevalent in New York City, but when I left Pittsburgh, I went to New York City to practice. And in New York City, people are always coming in. They say, "I want to see the best doctor," and I always said, "I'm just an average doctor. I want to see the best patients." <laughs> So, so here's the question that we asked. You know. um, we said, okay, are the elders correct? Are the people who are getting the um, cures, are they also the people who are having the most profound spiritual transformations? Are the people who are having the least response to the interaction with the elders, are they the people that are having the least spiritual transformations? And it turned out that statistically, significantly, this was so. That, that, it was, that if you had a profound spiritual transformation, you were much more likely to have a really positive outcome than if you didn't. And, and so um, I would argue that because this was a five years, we followed these people for five years or more, and the spiritual transformation happened before the outcome, I would argue that there's one kind of imply a cause and effect here, you know, to some degree, of course. But but it's not a correlational study in the sense of, you know, we know we, what came first, the spiritual transformation. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. This is this was I got five minutes and this was the start of the brain science. So no brain science today. Because I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about someone who had a profound spiritual transformation, just so you would get a flavor for it. Um, this was a woman with metastatic colon cancer. And 
it had gone to her liver in so many different places that the, her physicians didn't know what to do. And it had metastasized to some other places also. And so she contacted me and she wanted to connect with elders, you know, connect with healers. And so typically in that setting, I, have, I usually have to train people how to be with elders. Because you can't just take a person from mainstream America and walk them onto the res and put them into the house of the elder and expect it to go well. <laughs> it's not going to happen. They need training. They have to be taught how to behave, and you know a lot of things go into that. So, so I agreed to take her on and do that training so that she could connect with the, with the elders that she wanted to see. And and um, she did. You know, she worked hard at this and and um, took it really seriously and began to. Um, talk, you know, dialogue with her tumor and, you know, talk to her ancestors and just get into that uh, mysterious world that you could say is all metaphor and it'll still work. Or you could say it is real. And maybe it works a little better if you believe it. I'm not sure that study hasn't been done. But anyway, we, so when we finally got to see her, when she finally got to the elder and was ready for him. This was a Yaki healer. And he did this amazing ceremony that he had a number of us assist with. And, um, and of course, in these contexts, you know, um, great things happen that when you tell other people about them, you realize that you'll never get tenure. So, um, <laughs> So we saw, we saw a face in the clouds, you know, which was just remarkable. And we all started smelling roses, you know. And, and we didn't know what that meant, you know, but it was pretty cool. And, um, you know, she told us, she said, that's um, St. Teresa. I didn't know who St. Teresa was for me. You know, one saint is as good as the next. But, you know, she said she's St. Teresa of the roses. You know, she'd been raised Catholic you know, and, and dropped it because, of course, the nuns were mean to her because um, that was a common experience for some Catholics. But she really liked Mary. And she thought Mary was cool. And she, when the nuns were mean to her, she, at Catholic school, she'd go complain to Mary. She'd go to the statue outside of the school and sit next to it and talk to it. And she realized that that, that statue was more real than the nuns. You know, that statue was the instantiation of that Mary energy. And so what happened after the ceremony, she said, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an Indian, she said. But I could, I could go back to being a Catholic in, the way that, in a way that would be deeply, profoundly meaningful for me, instead of the way that I came to hate the you know, compliments of the nuns. And that's what she did. She went home and she became I would call her a Mertonian Catholic. You know, she became a mystical Catholic, and and um, her liver tubers uh, mysteriously merged into one tumor, and it was receptible. That was cool. And um, and her other tumors disappeared, all but one that they could take out also. And so so she. Um, she went for five years cancer free. But over those five years, she started to drift away from her commitments and back to her old behaviors. And as predicted by the healer, the cancer returned. So she came back to see the healer. And, um, you know, he worked with her some more. And cancer went away again for another five years. Slowly she drifted back to the old ways. Six years, it came back. And this time the healer told her, he said, the spirit said that you might not get a third chance. He said, oh, we'll give it a try. And, and this time the tumors improved, but they didn't go away and she eventually died. But um, 15 years after she was supposed to die, which, you know, that's pretty good. 
So that was a profound transformation. You can see, though, that it, I think I think what she didn't have that we all need is a community to go back to. You know, it's like it's why 28 day programs don't work for the most part because you send people right back to the environment that drove them to drink in the first place. You know, that we are the products of our environment. Neuroscience is showing us that more and more. That our brain is a social brain. You know, that, that um, social experience controls at least 1,500 clock, you know, clock genes, oncogenes, other genes, turns them on, turns them off. Probably time. <laughs> so, <laughs> So speaking of turning off genes, it's time to turn me off. <laughs> so I, I thank you for listening. And I, I hope um, this was useful to you. And I'll, I'll be around to, to dialogue more. And, uh, that's all, folks. Thank you.